Well, hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Nefesh Podcast. This is episode 17. I am excited that you are listening in. If this is your first time, welcome. And if you've been listening, you've listened once or twice, it's good to have you back. And this week, I am talking about shame and the soul. Shame and its effect on our spiritual formation, our soul, and the effect that the shame that we impose upon others, the effect that it has upon their own souls. Now, I know all of us as humans, surely at some time in our life, we have not only felt shame, but probably embarrassed over something. I, I have more than enough stories to you know fill hours and hours of podcast time, uh, like you know, accidentally walking into a wall while looking the other way. Thankfully, nobody saw that one accidentally. And this was a true accident. I'm not doing false air quotes. Uh, but accidentally sitting on some guy's lap as I'm trying to get up from the altar on my knees and slowly backing my way up back to the pew, thinking nobody was there because I didn't see them out of my periphery and almost, you know, well, I think I did sit down and and he, you know, was kind enough to, you know, say, whoa, there's somebody here. Um, There have been, uh, there have been several, several embarrassing moments, um, you know, driving into a curb, with uh, students in my car at night, uh, not realizing at the time that I needed glasses, thought it was a driveway, it was not, it was a sidewalk, and I drove right into the curb and popped my tire. Many embarrassing moments, um, and embarrassment and shame, or, or feeling embarrassed about something, it's a normal part of humanity. The feeling of being ashamed of something, especially if it's something that you've done and you've done wrong. It's a normal part of our humanity. And in fact, there are parts of shame that are good, that are healthy. People who don't feel a sense of shame for something that they've done wrong, those are actually signs of really, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of psych, uh, psychology or psychopathy, uh, things like uh, uh, psychopaths or uh, sociopaths, people who are unable to f- not only feel empathy, but feel a sense of uh, wrong or conviction over something that they've done wrong. We want to know when we've done something wrong because we don't want to do it again. There is today in our world, especially in Western society, there is such an emphasis upon perfection. And we all fight against it. There is a standard that is imposed upon us by the world at large, and we form part of that world. We ourselves impose it upon ourselves, and we impose it upon others, especially those of us who are perfectionists. I think to a certain extent, we all are perfectionists in some way. We like certain things the way we like them. And, um, and we probably beat ourselves up pretty good when we fail to meet a certain standard, when we fail to meet a standard of p- perfection. But, but we, we have so much around us that imposes uh, perfection standards, the way we look, the way we talk, the way we dress, how much money we have or don't have, the kind of house we live in, where we live, how we live. Uh, we are we are constantly in this cycle, uh, a perpetual cycle of trying to live up to a standard again that we all contribute to. We can't blame it on just one part of the world or a certain person or the world at large. It's all of us contributing to this endless cycle of of at aiming for protection uh, perfection not meeting that that standard, failing and beating ourselves up for failing to meet that standard. And some people, unfortunately, give up at various times because the, the struggle to reach that perfection standard becomes so overwhelming. In fact, I read an article years ago that talked about burnout and even depression and it said it really comes from 
struggling to striving to attain to a standard of perfection that is not possible. It's elusive. We will never get there. We will never be good enough. We will never be uh, fit enough. We will never be pretty enough, smart enough, have enough money. We will never be enough. There is, again, a a standard that we as humans are striving for that really brings us back to our broken and fallen and incomplete nature. And we may struggle with passages. I know I did and have still, but, but really at a certain time in my life, I was really struggling with it. That verse, I believe it's in Matthew 5, 42, where Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I remember one night wrestling with that verse, struggling to sleep because I just felt overwhelmed by my sense of imperfection. All of the things that I wasn't doing well, the things that I wasn't doing, uh, that I uh, wasn't doing right, that I was feeling like I was failing at. And I got out of bed and I just began to look at the scripture and I began to pray and I I began to look deeper into the scripture and I saw that that word perfect as I began to uncover what it means in the Greek, that word perfect in the Greek means whole, complete, mature. And one of the words is perfect that they use, but it's also part of a bigger uh, definition of wholeness, completeness, and maturity. That perfection isn't what we, as especially what Jesus tells us to strive for. He is not t- uh, telling us to strive for a standard that we cannot reach. I, in our twisted human minds, we think, well, if I raise the banner so high, a perfectionist impossible standard, I know I won't meet it, but maybe I'll get higher than I would have if I didn't have that high of a standard. It doesn't work like that. We will again perpetually find ourselves in that cycle of of not reaching it and failing and feeling like we have missed the mark or we have missed something again. It's not about attaining to a, a standard that we can't reach. That's not what Jesus is saying to us. He is encouraging us to become whole and complete and mature. The essence of perfection from a biblical standard is not one of never making a mistake. And I'm not talking about sinful mistakes. I'm talking about accidentally walking into a wall um, or or driving into a curb um, thinking it was a driveway. It's not about never making mistakes. It's about allowing those mistakes to be formed in us for God to take those mistakes and form in us the person that he has called, created us to be. And when we perpetually find ourselves trying to attain to a standard that we will never reach, we will find ourselves in a cycle of guilt and shame for those who have struggled with addictions, and, and we all have some type of addiction. We may not realize it, but we, we all fixate or are trapped by something. Some it is drugs, some it is alcohol. Some of it is, some, for some people it is pornography. For others it might be food. For others it's fo- uh, uh, money and things. Others, it's again a, a, an addiction towards, towards uh, a, an out, outward perfection of themselves, an addiction towards health and fitness, where if, if you don't exercise or eat right for a day, you're feeling shame and guilt upon you for not continually maintaining that standard. Now, some addictions are extreme and and uh, and very different they are all all different from each other and so i don't want to minimize 
the more extreme addictions that truly, truly imprison people. And if you listen to last week's episode, if you didn't, you really need to with, with Alex Delgado, an amazing, amazing guy. Um, and he, the prison of addiction that just surrounded him. There are some addictions that are so strong that it is only by an act of God that we can, and truly the, the deliverance power that, that is there available to us, that we can be free. But we all have something that we turn to to help us feel better about life and about ourselves. We all turn to something to help drown out the perpetual guilt and shame and feelings of worthlessness or feelings of unhappiness, of hopelessness. The origin of, of shame, at least from, from a human and biblical perspective, can be seen when we go back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. I really love Genesis, and I love teaching on the Old Testament. I just feel like there's, there's so much there. It, there's so much mystery, so much unknown, and yet so many glimpses of God's love that people can easily miss if they don't really... Uh, un understand and take the time to unpack it. I just love it. I love Genesis, especially in Genesis chapters two and three. It it sets us up for the what is known as the fall when humanity stepped outside of a relationship with God, and that's how uh, Menzies and Horton in their book uh, Bible Doctrines really refer to sin, and I appreciate that definition. We, we tend to, we tend to, uh, and I, we have for sure in the, in throughout church history, Christian history, we have labeled things as sin that are not sins. And we have condemned and shamed others for things that are certainly not worth uh, being shamed or condemned over. They are not and were not sins. And they describe sin as this, this choice this choice to be out of a relationship with God, that in my act of sin, I am choosing at that moment to, to, even if it's just for a split second, separate myself from that relationship with God. And so Adam and Eve, as they are known, as they become uh, at least, yeah, as they become referred to and, and, and kind of named in Genesis 2, at the very end of the chapter, it talks about the fact that they are, they get married, right? They have a ceremony in, in the garden. I don't know if they had a ceremony, but maybe the animals were there as witnesses. I don't know. But, um, you know, God creates Eve. He brings her to Adam and it's all good. And it, the very last part of it says that they were naked and yet they knew no shame. It's an interesting verse. It's an interesting way to describe their condition. They were naked and they knew no shame. Well, the word naked in Hebrew, it, it infers, it implies a vulnerability, an openness. Being vulnerable is to be open. And that's really what it is to be naked, to be fully exposed in your humanity with nothing to hide and nothing to, you're not covering up any part of your identity or of your humanity. They were completely vulnerable and completely open. What I often find myself doing, I, I uh, you know, I'll have people or students especially who'll say, you know, in the, in the garden, Adam and Eve were perfect. And I have to pull them back and say, whoa, 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 hey, hang on a second. Nowhere in the Bible does it say or even imply that Adam and Eve were perfect. It just says they were naked. They were vulnerable. And there is an implication that they were innocent because they did not yet know good and evil. 
So if you don't know the story, if you look at Genesis chapter two, God tells them that they can eat of any tree in the garden, but they just can't eat from this one tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that whole title is important. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of good and evil. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by eating from that tree, as the story progresses, they both eat from that tree and they know both good and evil. And they know they come to have an awareness, especially of evil. And it's important in that narrative, again, so the implication is that they're innocent. They're, they're not not children in maturity, but children in their innocence, right? Children, um, those of you who have kids, I, I've, I've been around uh, kids all of my life, nieces and nephews and all of that, and especially when they're young, they don't like to wear clothes. They, they are ripping off their clothes as soon as they can. They're wanting to walk around naked or, you know, they're not really concerned about covering up. But there's a certain point that they catch on. They realize that not only is everybody else around them covering up, but there's a certain point at which a child loses their innocence to the reality of evil in the world. They, they, they wouldn't be able to explain it as that. But there's a sense at which they understand that they have to cover and protect themselves and protect their bodies. Well, Adam and Eve are with each other in the garden. They're naked and it, it says that they know no shame. And so often or, or at, at times throughout, throughout uh, Christian history, people have misinterpreted that to say that nakedness somehow is shameful. It's not. Um, it is, it is not, the shame is not referring to their nakedness being a bad thing, but the shame is indicating that there's nothing to hide from. There's nothing to cover up from. They've not done anything wrong and they've not experienced anybody else doing anything wrong so that they would feel a sense of shame. Shame, especially as, as, as we see it today in, in, in areas of mental health and counseling and, and therapy, for those who have uh, experienced abuse, particularly sexual abuse, they, they, their boundaries have been violated and their shame awareness may be altered or affected to the point where they don't understand or recognize healthy shame anymore. Or they may be so overcome with shame that they can hardly function. Every part of their life is about apologizing and feeling bad and they feel ashamed for everything. Or there's no filter around them because that shame has been, that shame factor, that, that boundary factor has been so violated that they don't feel ashamed or, or shame for anything. Nothing has happened to Adam and Eve. They haven't done anything to each other. They haven't been affected by the world. And so there's no sense of feeling bad about anything until in chapter three, when they both eat from the tree. And as they do, the scripture says that their eyes are opened and you can see this, this pattern or, or this, um, this cause and effect as one thing leads to another. They eat from the tree that they weren't supposed to. Their eyes are opened 
and they realize that they are naked. Now again, think in terms of, of not just, oh my gosh, I realize I'm naked. What was, I mean, there was nobody else there. It was the two of them. It was, if you go by the kind of the literal understanding, it's just the two of them, it's just the animals. Why are they all of a sudden feeling bad about being naked? Again, if we look at the what the Hebrew is implying there, that nakedness is about their vulnerability. Their eyes are opened and they realize how vulnerable they are. I like to picture it as all of a sudden they see each other and if you've seen any like scary movie or I'm picturing Captain America and the part where, you know, the bad guy, his, he takes his face mask off and it's like this red, like really grotesque red skull like face underneath. That's what I'm picturing that they, all of a sudden their eyes are open and they see each other in that way. This sense of fear, this sense of evil that perhaps they are now looking at each other and seeing within the other person the possibility that that person can harm me. They weren't feeling bad about the fact that they were naked. They were suddenly aware that they were vulnerable. And they were suddenly aware of all the dangers around them. And they were suddenly aware that this person to whom they had been so close now had the ability to harm them. And they didn't understand it before, but they did when their innocence was lost and their eyes were open. And what do they do? They run and they hide. They hide both from each other and they hide from God. It says that they, they took fig leaves and they sewed them together as covering for themselves. Again, just a few moments ago, they were naked and it was no big deal. It's not like somebody else has shown up on the scene. Why are they covering up from each other? Because they don't want to be that exposed or vulnerable anymore. There is fear. There is an awareness of evil. But they also run and hide from God. As if they could, but it was their instinct. Their instinct was to run and hide from God. And of course he shows up on the scene and says, Hey, where are you guys? And they say, We're hiding because we... We did something wrong. And again, if you've had kids or worked with kids, you know that's the, that's the, uh, that's the, often the tendency. I, unless, again, the, the child has not a, not a bad unawareness, but, you know, maybe they're just okay with the fact that they've eaten all the cookies that they weren't supposed to eat. And they're just kind of hanging out doing it. But I think often enough, you know, you find a child off in a corner with their hands in the cookie jar eating the cookies they shouldn't be eating. They're trying to do it undercover and they're trying to do it quickly before they get caught. Um, that this idea of hiding and covering ourselves from, from the consequences, from the evil, from the punishment, from the fear of what others can do to us. This is what shame, the immediate reaction of shame does. Suddenly there's an awareness that we've done something wrong. And it is a human part of us that, 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 goes through and must go through a process of growth and spiritual formation, but there's a human part of us that just instinctively desires to cover it up, to push it aside, to pretend it didn't happen, to pretend we aren't bothered by it, 
to lie that we didn't do it, to not take responsibility for it, to cover up this awareness of of what we have done or the fear of what we have potentially have done causes us to push ourselves away from the act so that we can put distance, try to put distance from ourselves and it because it becomes overwhelming. Shame in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, Ray Anderson in his book, Self Care, um, he makes a distinction and he says that shame is different from being shamed. He says that shame, quote, or quote, having a capacity for shame keeps us from doing something that causes us to be shamed, end quote. But he says, quote, being shamed is a violation of the self which occurs with human interaction, end quote. Shame and the awareness, a, a sense of shame, if you've ever heard that phrase or maybe somebody's used it on you or you've used it on others where you have you no shame, right? Um, like have you no sense of what is right and wrong? Shame is is kind of tied to that conscience idea. This, this understanding that what we are doing, it, it really does, and again, according to Anderson, he says that it, it keeps us, it really helps to keep us in the boundaries of our own humanity. And there are some people who seem to live without shame. There's a whole, a whole TV show called Shameless that's no longer on, um, I, I, it was on HBO or Showtime or something years ago. I remember seeing the title for it. And you just know what it's about just by watching the title, Shameless. Like this family has no sense of shame and they, they live out loud all over the place and all parts of themselves can be seen and there's no sense of rightness or wrongness. But a sense of healthy shame helps to keep us, it's a type of self-awareness that reminds us of what is good and not good, what is healthy and not healthy. If we go back to Adam and Eve in the garden, the issue was not, um, the, the issue was not about eating the fruit, whatever it was, the poor apple that always gets the blame for it and shows up then in Disney movies like Snow White. Uh, probably wasn't an apple. Apples are too good. It was something else gross that 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 pretends to be a fruit. Um, but it they it wasn't about that. It was about God protecting them for as long as they could from an awareness of of evil. Once we open that door for an awareness of good and evil, we are now constantly guarding ourselves, trying to figure out right from wrong, but also trying to protect ourselves from being injured and harmed. Shame at its, at its basic essence, at its core, that sense of shame, that sense of right and wrong, that sense of conscious helps to keep us within our within our boundaries, within our, uh, within our understanding of who we are in relation to who God is. But being shamed or being cloaked in shame or allowing shame to overtake us really attacks the root of who we are. And again, we see this in those who have undergone, been victims of, of abuse, uh, but especially sexual abuse when boundaries have been violated. Their understanding of shame becomes either overwhelming and they, they never can seem to come out from underneath it. Or 
they lack a proper sense of what is right and wrong. And they, because their very identity and sense of worth has been shattered, they might go out and do things they wouldn't normally do because they've lost a sense of true identity and self-worth. According to Anderson, Ray Anderson, he says that shame, that this being shamed has to do with a loss to one's identity and being. That we develop, according to Anderson, a deep sense of unworthiness. And that we can become overwhelmed with a sense of guilt and consciousness and rigid in our, in our belief system that we have to do good, be good, in order to win God's favor or our guilty conscience or our, our sense of guilt and consciousness and shame becomes numb and we go to the other extreme as if it doesn't matter what we do because our self-worth is no longer important. A sense of unhealthy and destructive shame or being shamed is detrimental to the soul. If you've ever read Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, I remember reading it in high school. It's about, for those of you who don't know, it's about a woman in the, I think the story was written in the 16, 1700s, at about a woman who has to wear a scarlet, the scarlet letter A um, around her, around her neck, I think like as a necklace or it's pinned to her clothing. That that is her punishment for having an affair, having a child uh, uh, through this affair and for the rest of her life, she has to wear this scarlet letter around town. And everybody can see it, her shame. She's wearing her shame, the scarlet letter of A for adultery. Because she sinned. And that that thought, especially within the Puritan community, the Puritans, by the way, have a lot in common with the legalistic Pharisees. Both, both movements initially desired to follow God so perfectly with a motive, uh, a desire to not ever fail God or sin against God. They never wanted to experience God's punishment again as the Jewish people had or they just wanted to follow God so earnestly that for both groups, both the Pharisees and the Puritans, it often turned into legalism and burdens and wearing scarlet letters or burning witches, people perceived as witches at the stake in, as it relates to the Puritans. Well, in this book, The Scarlet Letter, I'll just give you the ending. If you don't want to don't wanna know the ending, you can just fast forward. But in the end, you find out that um, it is the pastor, the preacher of that city who was not married, who had had this affair with this woman, and that this child was, in fact, his. And that I think in, at some point in the book, he kind of opens his shirt in pain as there is a scarlet letter burned on his flesh, on his chest. She wears her scarlet letter around for everybody to see, but his own guilt and shame have burned it into his chest, the sin that he committed. 
neither of those extremes. He hid from the sin while she was, was, was shamed by the community and shunned. And neither move us toward growth and spiritual healing. I like the way Anderson in his book, Self Care, I like the way he, he identifies again the, what guilt or what conviction is really doing. Guilt, he says, is really the objective reality of not measuring up to a standard. If I run a stop sign and I am, I am pulled over by the police, it is simply the guilt that I feel is simply the awareness that yes, I ran a stop sign and I, I didn't live up to that reality. I broke the law. But my breaking the law right then and there has nothing to do with my value or my identity. If I feel shame as a result of running that stop sign and breaking the law, or I am being shamed by others. I am allowing the simple failing of an objective standard to define my identity and my value. And that is what God never intended for us. And the way he broke that was through sending his son Jesus to once and for all break that guilt and that shame off of our lives that sin has to say all as Romans Paul says in the book of Romans all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God all of us have not measured up to that standard but there is a way to be reconciled to God and the fact that he loved us so much to die for us establishes our value and our identity while we were in the midst of our sin. He loved us in the midst of our sin. And his love for us establishes our value and our identity that no one can take away that our own failings, when we fail to meet that objective standard, that when we break God's law, when we sin, when we blow it, there is an objective reality. We have messed up. But that objective reality doesn't have to define my value. And it doesn't define my value and my worth because Christ is now our righteousness. I love the fact that only two places in scripture, Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter nine, it talks about humanity being made in the image of God. It's important to know that, that we were made in the image of God from the very beginning in Genesis chapter one, and we were still considered made in his image even after the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter three, after Adam and Eve blew it. And we were, we were yoked with, we were, this burden of sin was an awareness of evil was all around us that the fall did not remove the image of God that we were all made in, that our value, it didn't take away our value and our worth. And we know this because this is confirmed in John three sixteen that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, uh, that who would ever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And in Romans five, it tells us that while we were still sinners, God loved us and sent his son to die for us. The guilt or the condemnation, which is probably a, a better word to use 
as Paul then even goes on in Romans 8 to say, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. And later on in that chapter, it describes how he calls us his sons and his daughters. Did you know that the only time scripture refers to people as God's sons and daughters, especially in the New Testament, is when he's referring to Christians? That as we invite Christ to take over our lives, we enter into this relationship with him where we are called sons and daughters. All humanity is made in his image and he loves and values all of humanity. But when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we are then called sons and daughters of God. And he continues in Romans 8 to where Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And he lists off a ton of things that cannot separate us from his love. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be ye complete. Be ye whole. Be mature, be growing. That is, that is the standard to which Jesus calls us. He invites us out of the shame of our past, either what we've done or what has been done to us, and he invites us to let go of the condemnation that we will feel for things and struggle with. He doesn't invite us into a blind numbness or denial about our lives and what we have done to others. And when we have done things to others, there is restitution required. And when things have happened to us, there is healing that is needed. And part of that healing from destructive shame is the vulnerability that is required by bringing that issue, that, that, that condemnation, that sense of shame, that, that sense of, of failure, and allowing there to be light, allowing there to be openness. Because shame, as Anderson says, thrives in secrecy. And it's not that just simply sharing whatever it is that we feel ashamed about will make it go away or will make the healing compete, complete. Healing comes through relationship with God and relationship with others. Our soul's journey, our spiritual formation is a lifelong process of growing into Christ-likeness and of day by day in this journey with him, allowing him to put the broken pieces of our life back together, allowing him to heal the parts of us that are wounded, allowing him to bring people into our lives who can help and speak into it, allowing us to engage in spiritual practices and disciplines that help us to connect with God on a deeper level. That is what he longs for us. Nothing can measure up to the love that Christ has for us. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. And the standard to be perfect, that is not the standard to which God has called us. He has called us 
to be like him, to grow into his likeness, to grow into maturity, and to wholeness, and to completeness. Well, thank you for listening as we really engaging in a, in a difficult topic that we, I think we all really need to remind ourselves of and that we would continue to strive towards that, finding that healing and that wholeness. And confession is definitely one of them. Confessing our, our sins one to another, as James chapter 5 tells us, confessing not even our sins, but confessing and sharing the brokenness, whether you need to find a therapist or counselor or a friend or pastor, um, or even I'd love for you to share even with me you can email me questions or things that you just want to share. The Nefesh podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Well, thanks for listening this time, and uh, we will talk to you next time.